Hi, welcome to Poll 2 PPE. How do economies and societies interact? Competing approaches in political economy. In this subject, we're going to be looking at a variety of schools of thought in what's called political economy. And we're going to be studying the competing explanations that they provide of the relation between societies and economies. We'll be able to see and explore different theories about why some people are employed and why others are unable to secure the work that they need. We'll look at why economic activity takes place in cities rather than in rural and remote areas and how economists have explained and made sense of that phenomenon, as well as contributing to it. We'll look at why governments are unable to secure agreement on solutions to problems like climate crisis. And we'll explore these questions through a variety of different schools of thought and how these uh, how thinkers in these schools of thought have attempted to respond to historical problems. What we'll show is that, in a nutshell, the way in which economists and political economists think can be viewed as responsive to historical problems that seemed particularly important to deal with in their moment in time. We'll compare the theories to show how these competing views lead to very different interpretations of what government should do as a function of the problems that the economists conceptualise themselves as having. And we'll get a sense of the very different ways in which economists have thought that society should structure their economic interaction between individuals, families, households, firms and so forth. So that's, in a nutshell, what this subject will be about. In this first week, however, we'll be turning to the question of what is politi political economy and then trying to provide an overview of the subject as a whole, its structure, its logic, our approach and so forth. It's always nice to know your teaching staff, so let me introduce us. You'll have two um, people teach you this semester. Um, I'm Dr. Miriam Bankowski, and my pronouns are she, her, and I'm an associate professor in political theory in the politics, media and philosophy department. Um, my original background was in political philosophy, but I have also done a lot of work in the history of economic thought um, and I have a new book forthcoming with Cambridge University Press entitled The Family, um, or Economics and the Family, um, A Social and Political History, um, where I look at the way in which um, economists since the night from the 19th century to the present have um, conceptualised the role of families in, the, in economic life. I'm also um, doing a collaborative project with um, some professors overseas, um, uh, Rebecca Bettencourt and um, Miriam Johnson on, on um, birth control technologies, birth control, contraception and abortion, and how these have been understood by economists historically as well. Um, so that's a bit about me. Um, you're lucky to have um, Jesse Brindley as your tutor in the subject. Um, Jesse is uh, currently a PhD candidate, um, mainly situated in philosophy, but with close ties to sociology and politics. Um, Jesse's um, undergraduate and master's degrees were in um, philosophy, and his current project in his PhD is about the work of a classical German philosopher called um, George Zimmel. And um, Jesse's looking in particular at the philosophy of money in Zimmel's work, um, looking at how um, Zimmel's understanding of money can provide an insight into the way in which Zimmel 
conceptualises um, philosophy and how we ourselves structure our lives with overlapping concepts um, that allow us to um, make sense of our lives in using these concepts in intersecting ways. Money is a central concept for Zimmel. So you're very lucky to have Jesse um, with expertise in the philosophy of money to be um, your tutor in this subject. Um, so that's us. So the plan for today is to quickly provide an overview of what our goals are in this subject, to consider what political economy is, to also um, consider why we might want to study political economy. We'll briefly um, discuss some key terms and definitions which will crop up um, basically every week in different ways because these are concepts and terms that um, uh, play a different role in the very different theories that we'll be discussing. Then we'll turn to how we will study the different theories of political economy, not just what political economy is, why we should study it, um, but how we'll study it in this class. And we'll notice that we'll take a historical approach to that study. A historical um, approach that looks at the context and problems that economists accepted as their own in different time periods. An account then that tracks the emergence of methodologies and theories in economics and political economy as responsive to those problems. And a third act of the analysis where we um, develop uh, a critical lens on those theories and methodologies, asking questions about um, who benefits, who loses, and does it matter? Then I'll provide you with an overview of the subject, how we'll apply this historical lens and these different questions in each week um, and the different schools that we'll study. And finally, I'll deal briefly with the expectations for week one. So that's the plan. So our first goal really is to understand that a thorough grasp of the workings of an economy will really require that we understand how that economy works in relation to society, to social norms, behaviours, expectations, and also in relation to political processes and institutions. So um, as students know now who did poll one PPE with Jesse and I last semester, an economy is not necessarily a market. Markets comprise part of an economic system. An economy is uh, all of those various institutions that have a role in regulating um, the distribution of material resources in a society. So um, this is going to be um, closely related to um, society itself and how that society is structured. And it's going to be very closely um, related to the political institutions that exist in that society. Since um, the idea that, the, um, that we're studying um, the economy um, in through the lens of the interactions between economy, society and political processes. Um, uh, this, this will in, in effect be our definition of political economy. Um, political economy is an understanding of how the economy, society and political processes interact. And this being the case, our second goal is to explore important historical schools and how these schools conceptualise these interactions between the economy, society and political processes. Our third goal is to show that these schools and theories themselves grew out of a perceived need to respond to particular historical problems. So our, our subject in the, is in this way, uh, historically focused. It's um, uh, 
we explore these method methodologies and theories in political economy through the lens of quite precise and distinct historical problems as these problems were conceptualized by the economists in question. Um, and this means that we show how the economists conceptualize themselves as, uh, as being forced in a way to focus on certain processes rather than others by the uh, exigencies, the urgencies of the situation. A fourth goal is to consider what our own contemporary problems might be today and whether and how past historical theories can help us respond to those. And finally, a fifth goal um, is to help you to contextualise mainstream economics as just one, albeit the most dominant, of a number of competing approaches to the study of economics. If I can put it in a nutshell then, really our most important goal is to understand how the economy, society and political processes interact through the lens of studying the methodologies and theories developed by economists in response to the historical problems of their own times. That's our most important goal today. Oh, not today, in the subject as a whole. So let's now consider the question, what is political economy? Let's first consider what is meant by the terms market, economy and economics so that we can use these concepts to try to help us understand what political economy is. So a market is normally referred to as a place, virtual or physical, where you can buy and sell goods and services. So eBay would be a virtual market. A physical market would be Preston Market, where you can go in person and buy fruit and vegetables with cash. Economy is different to market though. Market is a subset of a broader economy. Economy includes more than mere markets. The economy can be said to be all of the social practices that condition the possibility of producing consuming and distributing goods and services. It will thereby need to include social expectations of behaviour, government institutions for welfare, the provision of education and health through the use of our taxes to fund public institutions, because these institutions distribute resources in particular ways. The economy will also include institutions to secure competition. Households, businesses. It'll even include information technology systems that allow us to access different markets that would otherwise be impossible to access or even have. Um, like stock markets, for example. It would include justice and the administration of justice through the courts, um, the police. We need to know that contracts are going to be upheld, otherwise um, markets in goods will not be as effective. In, the military has a role too in conditioning the possibility of producing, consuming and distributing. A military and a efficient defence force can protect a country's economic system from incursion from others. Then there's overseas and transnational institutions too, like international law, international agreements and so forth. All of these have an impact upon producing, consuming and distributing. So the economy is much larger than markets. Now, economics. Economics, and some of you are studying economics, 
will know that economics is often defined as a social science that seeks to grasp the laws or patterns that explain changes in production, in distribution and consumption. Um, in uh, economics. Here you get to study microeconomics, which studies the choices of individuals and businesses and households at the micro level of agents of, of choice. And there's also macroeconomics, which studies broad trends between economic indicators, like between GDP and unemployment, and how these um, change in response to government activity or law or other uh, forms of um, uh, uh, change or influence. So that's what economics tends to be understood as. So what can we say then about political economy? Well, well, there are certainly overlaps between economics and what we'll call political economy. And some forms of economics can certainly qualify as a type of political economy. But the study of political economy tends to be viewed as broader and more nuanced than economics. And it's because, as Frank Stillwell argues in the text that's the required reading for you for this week, political economy tends to be viewed as the study of the economy that recognises the interconnections between the economy, society and political processes and is thereby open to uh, uh, methodologies that um, try to grasp the connections between these um, in their detail um, in ways that can sometimes be quite different to the methods used in mainstream economics. Again, there are certainly overlaps. It might be useful then to look at um, Frank Stilwell's article for this week and um, go into a bit more detail about how he understands political economy to consider whether that's useful to us. It seems to me that there are two components to political economy. First of all, there's the actual study, a nuanced and broad study of the economy and its intersections with society and political processes. And according to Frank Stilwell, the author of your required reading, the basic questions that comprise the study of political economy are what is happening why is it happening? Who gains? Who loses? Does it matter? If so, what can be done? And by, who, by whom? I'd add that before even asking what is happening, we really need to begin with a definition of a particular problem that one believes is in need of a solution. And we'll see that that's what many of the thinkers uh, involved in the schools that we will study today um, tend to do implicitly or explicitly. So we need to ask, what is, it, what is it that we are seeking to illuminate? What are the real world problems that we want to explain and resolve? And then we can ask what is happening in relation to those problems? Um, why is it happening? Who gains, who loses? Does it matter? And if so, what can be done? So that's the first way in which we can understand political economy as a form of actual study, a nuanced and broad study of the economy in its intersections with society and political processes. So the second component is political economy as the study of the main methodologies and theories that have been developed to make sense of the relationships between economy, society and political processes. And this is capturing the idea that political economy, how we tend to understand that term and that sub-discipline of study, political economy is not just the study of the relations between economy, society and political processes, but also the study 
of the variety of schools that have developed in different historical periods. So what this means is that studying the relationship between the economy, society and political processes today also requires a knowledge of how other political economists have historically theorised these interconnections in past times. So we need to do both. Um, we need to be able to study the relationship between the economy, society and political processes. But we also need to know the methodologies and theories that have been applied in past times to study these entities. So in some political economy is now not just the study of the relationship between the economy, society and political processes, but also requires the study of the concepts and theories themselves and how elements of historical approaches might be helpful for problem solving today. And so our subject tries to do both. It tries to do take a historical approach to understanding the methodologies and theories that political economists have used in past times to explain the relationships between the economy, society and political processes, precisely so that we can ourselves study the relationship between the economy, society and political processes today. So now we can get to the question of why study political economy? We might want to study political economy to have a better understanding of real world problems and to propose solutions that make better sense of the relationship between markets, the economy, social structures and political processes. We might want to study economy to secure an understanding of competing explanations and competing theories about a particular problem or state of affairs. For example, we'll discover in this subject that there are actually very different and competing explanations about what poverty is and why it exists and what we should do about it. We might also find it useful to cultivate an appreciation of economic theory, even mainstream economics, as responsive to particular historical problems and not as somehow separate from those problems or um, able to stand alone independently of those problems. And we might find this useful to the extent that it allows us to think through what sorts of theories might offer a better explanation or a better response uh, than another type of theory. We might also want to study political economy to expose ourselves to approaches to the economy that are broader than a conventional mainstream approach. And hopefully for PPE students studying economics, you might find um, the, the, the discussions here um, helpful for you in your um, study because it may push you beyond the constraints of the sorts of theories that you are um, uh, deploying and applying. And finally, it might be useful to enlarge your toolkit and your skill set to permit more nuanced analyses of a particular a problem like, like poverty or like um, uh, inequalities and so forth. We've already begun to talk about some definitions. We've talked about what, what, what we mean by market. We've talked about what we mean by the economy and how it differs with market, with the market and why the market is a subset of the economy. We've already spoken about uh, the state and its intersections with uh, social behaviors and the provision of um, uh, goods and services 
um, through other means, not just through markets. Um, we will find that we also speak a lot about um, capitalism, capital, labour, profit, rent, and so forth. So it might be useful to you to keep a notebook or an open document where you pop in the definition of these terms as you understand them uh, to, to produce a kind of glossary for your subject as you progress. Um, that might be useful to you by the end of the subject to come back to um, as you read and as you progress through um, to remind yourself of the different understandings of these concepts and terms. To this we can also add feudalism, um, we can add a division of labour between household and market, um, we can add comparative advantage, we can add a whole range of different concepts as we progress. So. This is just to encourage you to perhaps begin an open document with some definitions as we go through. So we've now looked at what is political economy? Why might we want to study it? And now we're going to look at how we will study it in this subject. How will we study these different theories of political economy? Well, we're going to modify Frank Stillwell's approach to suit our own objectives. You might remember that um, Stillwell's approach began with the question, what is happening? Why is it happening? Who gains? Who loses? Does it matter? If so, what can be done and by whom? And we notice that before we even ask, ask those questions, it might be actually worth asking, well, what's the actual particular problem that seems to be in need of a solution? What is it that we're seeking to illuminate? What are the real world problems that we're trying to explain and resolve? So what we're going to do in this subject is modify Frank Stillwell's approach to suit our own objectives. And we'll feature the following. We'll be going back to the different schools historically located in their own times to ask, well, what was the problem that these thinkers were trying to resolve? How did they understand the problem in their own terms? What were the real world problems that the economists trying to answer in different historical periods? And then we'll be able to look at their response. We'll look at their methodologies, the methodologies that the economists propose to study these problems. We'll look to at the theories they developed in response. And we'll look at how the economists propose to overcome the problems. What solutions and ideas for improving um, uh, life they um, proposed. Equally so, we'll consider um, the situation more critically. We'll have a critical consideration of these theoretical responses. We'll ask who gains, who loses? Should this matter to us? And what elements of an approach might we wish to reconsider? So we'll have a three pronged framework that we'll bring to our study of the different schools of political economy asking about the problem as they perceived it, the responses they formulated it, and our critical consideration of uh, their theories and their approach. What our approach will allow us to do is take a historical problem-oriented and survey-based approach 
to understanding the emergence of methodologies and theories in time. We've divided our subject into the key major schools that you would have already heard referred to in some of your other study and in your um, reading of popular culture and in newspapers. We'll look first at classical political economy, then Marxian political economy, then neoclassical economics. We'll look at the old institutional political economy, feminist political economy, Keynesian and post-Keynesian political economy, Austrian and, and neoliberal political economy. We'll look at behavioural economics. We'll look at queer, po queer political economy. We'll look at ecological political economy. As for classical political economy, we'll notice that in the 1700s and the early 1800s, classical economics emerged in response to cycles of the impoverishment in agrarian economies, in a context in which aristocratic landowners enjoyed considerable power over feudal workers. Classical economists, and you'll read some, their original writings, including by, for example, David Ricardo, Classical economists try to improve agrarian production by analysing how to make the process of production in agriculture more efficient. And they also provided theories of impoverishment based on analyses of the relationship between the human capacity for reproduction relative to the capacities of agricultural production to sustain people theories of poverty um, that um, had political implications in um, uh, advocating for these processes, the relationship between population and production to um, take place in ways that would allow for social evolution, a euphemism for letting poor people die if they couldn't feed themselves. We'll find out that in the mid 1800s, as, uh, uh, the, as economic life changed from agrarian to industrial forms of organization in Britain, we'll discover that Marxian, Mar Marxist um, economy, economics emerged in response to the immiseration of the working class which, be, had, which was increasingly acute under industrial conditions. So Marxian economists sought to identify how workers had been alienated from the industrial processes of production and how this might be overcome with worker ownership over the means of production. So a different interpretation of poverty and what to do to overcome it. We'll see too that in the second half of the 1800s, we see the birth of what's called neoclassical economics. Neoclassical economics emerged in response to, again, like Marx, like Marxian economics, the increasing significance of new forms of industrial organisation as populations increased rapidly in urban centres in uh, Britain's north. The first neoclassical economists sought to identify how people behaved in response to incentives, and they theorised that if families were left to their own devices in well-regulated markets, markets regulated by laws to protect contracts and to administer justice and to secure national defence, then families would satisfy their preferences in rational ways in the newly emerging markets. The idea was that poverty would spontaneously be overcome as people voluntarily limited their families in accordance with how much they could earn. And the idea was that people do know what they want and they act rationally to get it. Interestingly, in this context, the, the neoclassical economists like Alfred Marshall defended a family wage, a breadwinner wage for the male head of a household. 
which we'll analyse later through the lens of feminist economics. From the 1890s to around 1930, we see institutional economists emerging in response to the impact of institutions and norms on economic behaviour in constraining and promoting certain behaviours and outcomes. And then from around the 1900s to the present, we'll consider how feminist economists emerged in response to experiences of domestic violence, sexual assaults and precarity experienced by women and children as a result of the rise in independence for men that followed from the male breadwinner wage. This wage was higher for uh, men than for women because it was meant to support family life. Um, we begin our study of feminist economics much earlier than Steelwell, who relegates it to the end of the late 1980s, um, because the late 1980s was when feminist economic feminist perspectives became accepted by the discipline of economics. But we start much earlier in the 1900s, because there were these writings occurring mostly by women. Um, and even though these concerns became lost to the discipline, they um, until the late 1980s, they are located historically in problems like domestic violence, sexual assaults and precarity that belonged to the changing industrial context. Um, and we see um, this context still creeping its fingers into our present lives, obviously, too. So we begin um, that study from around the 1900s onwards. And we include earlier readings from the early 1900s that are described by some scholars as early materialist feminism, even though Stillwell doesn't include these in his reader. So then we go to the 1930s and 1970s to Keynesian and post-Keynesian political economy from the 1930s to the 1970s. And we look at how Keynesian political economy emerged in response to the Great Depression and to the increase in unemployment as families evacuated the Midwest Plains following the ecological disaster of the a Dust Bowl crisis, when the food bowl uh, literally turned into a Dust Bowl. So uh, the idea was if one could strategically boost the demand for goods in an economy that was depressed through government supported production like construction projects and government pro provided consumption subsidies and investments in the arts, then poverty might be overcome and economic activity would increase. How post Keynesian political economy uh, then emerged in relation to the the rebuilding efforts after war will also be considered um, when the destruction of capital across the European countries in the Second World War caused real problems in terms of how to support markets and to overcome unemployment and to uh, uh, secure employment, full employment. So we're now up to post Keynesian political economy here. From the mid 1970s onwards, we'll study the rise of neoliberalism, neoliberal economics, which was a return to the neoclassical economics in many senses of the late 19th century. Austrian economics had already emerged from the late 1940s as a counter movement to the Keynesian approaches that um, emerged after the Second World War. And in response to totalitarian governments in Eastern Europe, but it wasn't really until the mid 1970s that we saw uh, uh, neoliberal economics receive increasingly broader acceptance due to uh, crises of um, uh, increased um, unemployment alongside increasing inflation, a problem that uh, people thought Keynesian economics was ill-equipped to respond to, and we'll track that debate as well. 
We look at how neoclassical economics then comes to extend into the study of how people behave in response to incentives, also known as behavioural or nudge economics. And then since in our week on feminist political economy, from the 1900s to the present, we tracked how um, uh, feminists are brought to the discipline of economists, economics concerns about the um, inequalities um, experienced by um, women and men in an economy. We need to consider from the late 1900s on, onwards how queer economics emerged in response to theories of gendered injustice um, that the early founders of feminist economics had developed, which obscured increasingly visible social problems experienced by families of non-traditional organisation and of diverse gender identification. So queer political economy um, developed in part in response in the late 1990s to um, problems that were identified in the conceptual and theoretical frameworks employed by the feminist political economists. And it lent itself to different ways of doing political economy um, that would deploy different categories and different concepts for analysis. And finally, we turn to ecological economics and we consider how it emerged in response to the climate crisis and to environmental disasters. These are disasters that have arisen because of how governments, economists, societies, households and businesses have treated the environment as a resource to be used rather than a constraint on uh, behaviour, a constraint on economic activity if we want to behave in sustainable ways that allow humans to exist in a biosphere. So that's the overall plan for the subject where we really go through and we track the emergence of these competing theories of um, economic life and activity and the development of very different methodologies and theories of economic life as a response to particular problems that were important in the different time periods of the economists or political economists. So that's the, if you like, the overall broad survey of what we're going to cover um, week by week as we progress through this subject. So as we progress through this subject, I hope you'll begin to notice the interconnections between the schools and how they develop different methodologies and theories in order to try to explain or respond to problems that had either been overlooked by other theories and methodologies, or in some cases had even been deepened still further by the sorts of policy approaches that um, particular approaches became associated with when those were implemented. So perhaps if you can save this to file somewhere, this nice little um, summary of the some, at least some of the intersections between the approaches that we'll study. And um, perhaps consider as you go through how you would have reflected those intersections. So in this first week, um, we've introduced ourselves, we've introduced the, the subject of our study, we've considered what political economy is, we've considered why we might want to study it, um, we've considered how we'll study it, noticing that we'll actually take a historical survey-based approach, which is oriented around 
precise historical problems as they were perceived by the economists themselves. That will be the basis for us to analyse the methodologies and theories that have been proposed in different time periods whose vocabulary still continues to be used and referenced um, by um, political economists who study the economy today. And we'll also be able to bring critical perspectives to bear on those different methodologies and theories and ask ourselves whether their approaches and uh, solutions were um, helpful or useful and what other problems were overlooked, um, what other problems were potentially deepened by those approaches. And we'll get a sense of the um, ongoing um, way in which methodologies and theories uh, develop in response to uh, perceived problems. I hope in the end it will help you to develop not just an understanding of history and the emergence of theories and methodologies in history, in context, but also a grasp of the uh, tools that have been used in past times which continue to be used today, and um, a sensitivity and awareness of the need to look for uh, problems that might have been overlooked in past times and importantly today um, and a humility with respect to um, the present and the sorts of theories that we um, prefer today or prefer to use um, and openness to diversity and to the use of multiple tools in a diverse toolkit when approaching the problems that we have in our world today. So now, expectations for week one. Please read the subject learning guide. Please read it carefully. It includes a schedule of the topics, the readings for each week and the assessments. There's a full description of every assessment task on pages 15 to 21. Please also complete the reading for week one. This is available through the library reading list for the subject. Head over to the library page to find that. Please, please listen to a pre-recorded lecture. If you've got to this point, you can tick this off. Try to do this each week before the Tuesday tutorial. I'll also provide a copy of the accompanying slides that you can use um, uh, to make notes from. And uh, the lecture will be up on the Friday evening, the Friday afternoon, the Friday evening, um, in time for you to listen to it before Tuesday morning. In some weeks, in seven weeks out of 12, you'll have an opportunity to take a quiz on Monday on the readings. You need to do five out of the seven quizzes. So you can either choose which ones you want to do strategically, or you can do all seven and the best five will um, be part of your mark. That's a one component of the assessment. But head over to the subject outline um, to um, uh, check that out. And this week, of course, we will not have a quiz. We'll have a practice one in week two and we'll start for real in week three. Attend your tutorial on Tuesday and Jesse and I will look forward to meeting you there. So see you in class on Tuesday for your first tutorial. It'll be on at 9.30 a.m. Um, check your subject outline for the details and the details of live sessions are on the live sessions tab on your um, LMS site for this subject. There you'll be able to meet um, your tutor Jessie Brinley and I'll also be there for the first tutorial to meet you in person or on Zoom um, and make sure everything goes smoothly for the first week. Um, until then, have a lovely weekend. Bye.